Welcome to the Wine Show at Home. Welcome not only to the Wine Show at Home, but welcome to our new star for Series 3, Dominic West. Hello, Dominic. Hello, Joe. How are you? Lovely to see you. You, we've already spoken to you on the Wine Show at Home, but we didn't properly introduce you as to your new starring role because you are the new star of Series 3. What was it that first appealed to you about drinking wine in the most beautiful and famous estate in the Douro Valley? Well, it was a tough one, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> most, it was my Debbie McGee question. The, uh, yeah, the, prob the problem was it was, it was co-host with James Purefoy, which is never, a, you know, always a dodgy one because he's so, uh, he's, he, one can easily be led astray by him. But he, uh, no, he came to my daughter's 21st and gave me the best text I've ever had, which was come and drink wine in the Douro Valley. And I haven't looked back ever since. I'm so enamoured of my new job that I've grown a moustache because obviously that's what you really need if you're to um, clean your glasses properly as you drink. The moustache is outstanding. It's quite good, isn't it? It's yeah. Quite, it's, quite, it's quite, I mean, I couldn't have done it without lockdown. Now you're going to have to explain to everybody why do you have a moustache because you don't normally and you're not playing Saddam Hussein in any roles. No, not yet, but I'm hoping to get that. No, I'm playing uh, Uncle Matthew in Pursuit of Love, which is the first, uh, the first series back with the BBC since Covid. So we're filming. Thank God everyone's back to work. So what's your character? I'm Uncle Matthew, who is, um, I don't know why they cast me. He's a sort of uh, Colonel Blimp, uh, gruff, uh, uh, <laughs> Hunting, shooting, fishing, 1930s tweeds. So you, obviously. I think mean, nothing like me. Anyway, I got to ride with the Beaufort and I've, I've had a ball. So, uh, but part of it is that I have to wear this moustache. So I can't shave it off, I'm afraid. This was your first time on The Wine Show and you clearly enjoyed it. Um, was this your first time in Portugal? Um, pretty much. I mean, I went, I, went, I went through Lisbon on my way uh, somewhere when I was 18 or something, but yes, pretty much. And certainly my first time in the Douro Valley, which I couldn't believe. It's, it's just so beautiful. So, so that was, yes, it was my first time there. You also had this amazing arrival, far smarter than the rest of us, because you sort of arrive on a boat. Yeah, well, I happened to be, uh, <laughs> I happened to be dry, riding my boat around the Douro at the time. No, yes, that was rather nice, wasn't it? And I, I think I even got to drive it, but yeah, it was quite a, I mean, it was quite, I thought it was a bit dodgy when they said you, you come out of a boat and step into a Porsche, but actually when I did it, it felt rather good. <laughs> felt totally natural. This was absolutely fine. It is an amazing way to see the Douro Valley because you've got all those terraces all, and they go right down to the river's edge, the water's edge, don't they? So you, yeah. You yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're going to try the wines today. It was them, presumably, it was my first time at Quinta do Noval. Uh, right. who have provided the gorgeous wines for us today as well. Yeah. Gonzalez might distribute the wines in the United States. Oh, States. I see. Okay. okay. So, they've got, so, so thank you very much for the team there. Have they sent you five? They've sent me five. Um, I think at least two or three I've tasted before while, while at the Kinta. So it'll bring it, bringing back some lovely memories of a year ago. Well, I'm going to start off because... Get your white one open, because right. I think... This is the first wine we see you drinking in the entire series. Yes, the Cedro, the Cedro yes. Branco. Cedro de Noval, and we see the Cedro, because it's the cedar tree in yeah. the courtyard that yeah. we filmed underneath, didn't we? We did indeed, yes. James, yes, greeted me with a glass of this delicious um, vino Branco, which is their, their um, table wine, isn't it? It is white table wine. So this is not fortified, everybody, although this is in port. There are some fabulous non-fortified wines. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a top tip. Rather than drinking idiotically expensive white burgundy, unless you happen to have an awful lot of money, I go for this kind of thing all the time. I drink Portuguese brancos in place of very smart burgundy. Really? Yeah, totally. It is delicious. What grapes are we talking about here? These special Portuguese unpronounceable grapes. I know Vichinho is one, and is it Gouveia? I think it's Gouveia and Vichinho. And there are great varieties that we're not terribly familiar with. Mm. Um, but then that puts people off, but they still have the same structure of classy wines. I mean, it's quite full-bodied for a white in the mouth, aromatic, very fresh. Fresh um, and clean and crisp and yeah. And they, they age nicely in oak. 
Um, so you can, you know, they can live for quite a long time. And we're on the 2019, which I think has only just come to the UK. I'm going to grasp one and hold it up to um, the camera. They are rather beautiful wines, aren't they? Yeah, delicious. That's, for everybody to remember, that's called a prunt seal. There's your dinner party. Um, prunt? What does that mean? The, the glass seal on the shoulder of a wine bottle. Yeah. Is that a... It's got a bird on it. Yeah. Is that a Portuguese thing? No. Chateau Neuf de Pape does it as well. Chateau Neuf de Pape does it. Um, who else does it? Uh, Pic Paul de Pinay. You have to have it there. That's the, the punt. Punt of the punt. That's the punt. That's the prompt. It is the most beautiful wine estate in the world. It must be. With those white terraces and... Um, I think they were built in the 20s, weren't they? And most of them have gone now in the Douro, but they kept them at, at Noval. They did. Uh, th those beautiful sort of terraces. And you have to blow, the, the, use explosives to sort of plant vines in them because it's just such solid rock that you have to sort of blow up a little hole with dynamite and then you sit the, the vine in it. But then uh, the, the roots themselves are able to sort of work their way through the cracks and crevices in the, the rock to go and find minute quantities of water tucked away, hidden in the sort of rock itself. It's quite extraordinary. Um, incredibly labour intensive. You can't get a tractor on those terraces. Absolutely not. All done by hand, which is why these aren't necessarily the cheapest wines, you know, going. I mean, this is, to be honest, I think for, I mean, it's £19.50 in the UK, um, compared with the sort of £40 wines that you'll go and get in other parts of the world. I think it's extremely good value, but you're not going to get terribly bargain basement wines from you know the, the the Douro Valley because it is all done by hand and it's old school craft. Now whilst we get stuck into these wines just in case anybody is wondering what kind of expertise you had before this here is a little clip of you describing yourself as we started um, filming with the wine show. <laughs> oh hello hello Joe how oh, are hello. you? Hi, Joe. Hi. I have a new pupil. I'm an open book, a, a vessel that wishes to be filled. Have you opened a book before you arrived here? No. Good. Excellent. When Excellent. the pupil is ready, the master appears. <laughs> That's sort of the idea. <laughs> well, I, yes, I am an empty vessel. <laughs> was that scripted or did you, was that just... No, it wasn't scripted. I was an empty vessel at the start, but by six o'clock when we were treading grapes, I was... <laughs> I was an overflowing stoop. <laughs> what was that the most surprising thing? Because we we do get through quite a lot when we're when we're filming. Was does that come as a, a mild surprise? Well, we did start at about eleven o'clock and, and didn't really take a breath until six. So yes, that was. And I was very uh, shocked to discover that no one spits. But did you spit a bit? No, you didn't. No one spits. <laughs> Because nobody spits in real life. Why would we spit on, on camera? We... Quite right. And it doesn't look very photogenic, does it? Oof, no, not at all. Had you been to a wine tasting before? Well, was that a wine tasting? <laughs> this is my job. <laughs> no, I know. But a wine tasting, I thought, was, you know, rather a glum affair with 200 wines and lots of, uh, lots of spitting. You have a surprisingly good palate. I mean, what would you have been drinking before you came on the, on the show? White Burgundy. White Burgundy? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and, you know, you know, boring red Bordeaux. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm fairly unadventurous in that, in that regard. But I, I do love, yeah, I love, I, love, I love French stuff, I suppose. And, and now my eyes are opened as to um, Portugal. <laughs> so what do you think to this red? This right. is um, Cedro de Noval red. Uh, this actually has got a couple of years on it. We had this for lunch on the first day, if you remember. Right. Yes, I can, I can smell the sunshine. 2016. Again, £19.50. Um, did these wines surprise you when we, when you, when we started? I did, because I, yeah, I, you, know, I, you never really think of port as a, as a, and Portugal as a sort of, you know, table wine place and uh, so I, I, I thought they'd be hotter and sweeter and uh, fruitier but they're, they're, they're rather delicious I think rather lovely they're not the same grape presumably as the port wines no yes they're exactly the same they grape are. as the port wines totally they are the same grape. yes so you've got um, uh, Turiga Franca 
um, Tinta Roriz, uh, Toriga Nacional. Uh, what other great varieties do you have? I don't think this has got any Bastardo in it. It's not particularly, but you've got this exactly the same sort of cluster of grape varieties, but they're just made, they're harvested a bit earlier. They obviously they don't go through, they're not fortified in any way. Uh, you want to keep that nice freshness in them. This has a bit of syrup in it. So if you have right. a sniff, see if we can find it. It should be a sort of peppery syrup. Yes, definitely pepper, yeah. You get that. And actually it's a little bit, sometimes syrup, it's not minty like Cabernet Sauvignon, but there is a slightly sort of green herbal thing you get going on. So yes, they are. I mean, I think people are becoming more experimental and they're changing around exactly what the, the exact comp blends are. But this is really lovely general yeah. drinking wine, isn't it? Yeah. Peppery, Ooh. And, yes. Ooh, what was that? Ooh. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't, didn't we teach you to do this? Do you want to have a go? Always makes me cough that one. What does that do? That gives you the, the full aroma. Yeah, so the idea is you, you suck it in, creates a sort of aerosol at the back of your mouth, and then breathe out of your nose. Like that. And it's called retro nasal inhalation. So you sort of effectively inhale retro-nasally. That's ortho-nasally, if it goes up the front. But if it comes through the back of your palate, the sort of <coughs> way. Please don't, please stop doing that. <laughs> Just stop this immediately. Have a look. That's it. <laughs> it seems to possibly be something to do with smelling things up the nose is meant to ins sort of spy your appetite. It's meant to make you go, all right, I'll, I'll have some more of that. Thanks very much. I mean, I can't really tell the difference between smell and taste. I mean, they're so inextricably linked, aren't they? You actually can't taste anything without, if you, if you close your nose, can you? No, there isn't. Should we try this? Oh no, you can taste quite a lot. No, but don't you get that you get the, the building blocks, you get the scaffolding, yes. you don't get yes. the, the face. You don't get the, the, the vapour, yeah. We have five tastes, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami. Umami. And, and it's mushroom, basically. Is it earth, is it? Marmite. Oh. Uh, yeah. Anything sort of soy or yeasty. Anyway, incredibly peppery. It is peppery. I like that a lot. Now, I'm going to show a little clip here because you got quite profound on the show about what you found in a glass of wine. It was, you got quite sort of deep and, and mystical. Let's have a look at what this says. I mean, I suppose the history of wine is the history of humanity. And within them, there's so many stories of tragedy and disappointment and revival and rejuvenation. James, our work here is done. It's totally done, this isn't is, it? This is it. And the, thing that, and the thing that keeps it going, I suppose, is that we will always love drinking wine. Well, we always will. We always will. You found the history of humanity in a glass of wine. It was a route into... Well, it's true. Or the history of civilization, we should say. I think you can leave out the first, leave out the first two million years. Yes. I mean, we can go back um, 8,000 years roughly, we think. So go back to Georgia 8,000 years ago, or what's today Georgia, the Caucasus. So really? yeah, Georgia and Armenia, sort of they constantly, Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan all furiously claim the birth of viticulture. Georgians have evidence on their side because they've got 8,000 year old pits that have obviously been fermented. Right, have you got this fella? The Kolhata 2005. Kolhata. 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 You pronounce all the words Kolhata. I'm sure there'll be Kolhata. a Portuguese person who'll say it's not quite right. This is a tawny port. Oh, I love tawny. And what does Kolhata mean? It means... Well, you can't say vintage because vintage is just for vintage ports. So right. you have to have a different word. So you call it Kolhata. Which means vintage. It means vintage, yeah. So it comes from a single year. So this is the port of a single year because you could have um, like a 20 year old, which would have a blend of different ports, but they will be more than 20 years old. That's just tawny where you can have a blend. Um, well, yes, but you, well, you can also get, you get rubies as well where they can be blended. Um, 
Tawny, I have a, a special, you know, fondness for. Tawny's, particularly from particular years, can be particularly good because they're often from the very finest vineyards, but not in a vintage year. So the right. fruit itself is absolutely fabulous, but the year might not have been absolutely immaculate for making a vintage. So what do you do with that fruit? You turn it into a tawny. So that, up to the year it was bottled, which we quite recently was in a barrel. So it goes straight in a barrel and it sits in that barrel, which is why it has that extraordinary colour. They're quite small barrels, lots of... So they're, they're in touch with the wood, which gives them the, the, brown, the brownie colour. Yes, yeah, so they, they're in constant contact with the wood. They oxidise a little bit, which is why you get that slightly, slight sort of oxidation. And so you get lots of those wood flavours. If you have a sniff, nuts, dried fruit. Mm, Christmas. Christmas, yeah. Mm. Oh, that is good. Now, we had this on your first dinner, I remember. I don't think you'll remember. Mm, it's absolutely delicious. Do you remember what we did after that first dinner? Is that when we jumped in the Lagar? We went foot trading in the Lagar, didn't we? Absolutely. Did and you that, enjoy that, Dominic? <laughs> I, I feel terribly guilty about it. When, <laughs> when, when we walked in, there was a band playing and a sort of festive atmosphere. Mm. And we had been tasting wine since 11 o'clock that morning. Mm. And this was now, what, seven or eight in the evening. Mm -hmm. and, and I rather mistook the band and the um, festivities as, as being, you know, you can take the boy out of Sheffield. But I, at high spirits, I started, yes, horsing around. I think, my, I think where I went wrong is I fell over and got my T-shirt drenched in wine, which was a real no-no, I think. They thought, what a waste of wine. You were quite, yeah, so do you remember what you described yourself as, as you emerged from the gloom and the murk of the Lagar? I seem to remember somebody declaring that they were the god of wine. Um, whilst clutching grapes and squishing them in their hands. Right, yes. Well, I did, it did feel like that. I mean, I was swimming in grapes. It was amazing. Uh, yes, yeah, so Tawny, um, I, what's the deal with Tawny? That's, that's the, the, I always thought Tawny was the sort of poshest port, but it's not, is it? That's the LBV or is it, or we've got other ones coming up? Well, no, we're going to have LBV next and then we're going to go on to vintage. I think it's not so much a question of what's, and this is 50 pounds a bottle, so oh. it's quite smart kit. Um, it is particularly fine. I think that Tawny has a refinement about it. There's an elegance. With a cheese board, it is the greatest thing in humanity. It's utterly magical. I tend to have, uh, Tawny's, Tawny's a little bit, I put mine in the fridge for a, it's about half an hour, three quarters, something like that, and then sort of took it out. So just have it a, a little bit cooler. And that, as an early evening drink, you know, of a, of a, a, a sort of Indian summer evening. I know mm. it's a bit later on for that, but if we get a little bit of a warm spell now, sit mm. outside, glass of Tawny, keeps you going. Oh, September, yeah, what well, as an aperitif, you think? Yeah, absolutely, I like it very much. Should we try some foot trodden wine? The, if you get the, um, the LBV, here it is. So this is unfiltered late bottle vintage 2012 from Keaton and Naval's own vineyards in the heart of the Douro Valley. Uh, there's one vineyard I don't think this does come from because right behind the Quinta is the Nacional vineyard. Ah, the Nacional. Your face. You got to try Nacional, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes. yes I did. Do yes, you remember you... the special plot, wasn't it? A couple of hectares. It is. When you, when you were talking about terroir earlier, about the, you know, the special plots, this is the magic of Novales, and it's got this plot where Philoxera doesn't bother them. Mm. So they can, what does that mean? They can have they don't their have own roots. Or... They're planted on their own roots. So most vines, um, because of this uh, aphid, it's a sort of an aphid, I think, generally known as Philoxera, um, it's the aphid comes from North America, where there are lots of vine species that can effectively scab up. But European vines, as an illusion, are you know, as a, a sort of um, comparison, it's a bit like they're haemophiliacs. They've got no way of scabbing up these wounds that the, the phylloxera does. So, so the almost universally, vines have an American set of roots in the ground, 
and you graft on a European vine on the top. Nacional, it's just one plant. It's the same plant top to bottom right the way through. And for some reason, we know not why, this hallowed plot of land is unaffected by phylloxera. And it's one of very, very few places in the world. And that's why it's called Nacional, because it's a national icon, really, in the, in, the, in the whole of Portugal. For some of us, particularly in the wine world, there's something really romantic about having ungrafted vines, because we know that, really, unless you're prepared to drink stuff from before the 1880s, 1870s, you don't get to drink it, you know. And I've only ever had one or two genuinely pre-phylloxera vi wines ever in my career. Uh, and so here you get the chance to try something that's, that's that way. Yeah. It's nice but stuff. It's obviously, fairly unusual for Noval to have this plot. Well, unique, I think, in the in the valley. I mean, it's extraordinarily unusual. You know, I mean, fairly. I'm not going to say this is the wrong use of the word unique. But pretty extraordinary in Europe at all, and that's why Nacional is such an amazing thing to go and try. And we were amazingly lucky. I think we tried four vintages whilst we were there of Nacional, and I've never tried it ever before we arrived, and then got to try. We, and you day one wine tasting, four different vintages of Nacional. Pearl before swine. I like LBV. I'm, I'm a big fan. Umami. I'm getting a lot of umami. It is more umami this, isn't it? This I think is amazing value. £22.50 this. And it's, there's more savour to it, isn't there? A bit more meaty. Oh, mm. berry fruits. Mm. Juicy. Mm, rather explodes at the end through your nose, doesn't it? Yeah. Retro nasally. Retro nasally. It explodes. Delicious. So this has spent five years in a barrel. So it's not spent long enough to start going that tawny colour yet, but it's been long enough to soften it up and make it so you can drink it fairly straight away. So you're not, what's this, 2012. You don't have to drink, you know, wait for years and years to go and drink this. What, so hang on, so vintage port they'll bottle after how long in the barrel? Two years. Two years, and this is how long? Five, Five years. Right, time for some vintage, I think. And um, this is inky gorgeousness. And we are drinking it, I'm gonna show people, there's, there's going to be people who will say this is a sort of heresy. So we've got Quinta de Noval, 2018, vintage port. And there will be people out there who will say this is an outrage that we are drinking this now. And I say, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think this is one of the two perfect times to go and drink this wine. Why? Two years on. Well, look at it. I have a swirl around. So it's only just, you know, only just come out of the barrel. It's a new release port, inky dark color, vibrant fruits and there's real precision to it it's like summer pudding and and like fruit fresh off the vine you know sort yeah. of berries and currants and brambles and things like that and what so we should be drinking this in 50 years well what? i think you can drink it now or in 50 years well you yeah, know 20 years something like that i'm not a fan of drinking it in between but i think young vintage port is hugely underrated and absolutely gorgeous. Isn't that nice? I mean, it's mm. amazing wine. It is. It is. There is a freshness, isn't there? Mm. Mm. I think you should buy a case of vintage port, drink half of it over the next year or so, and then leave the rest until you're in a nursing home. Um, I can't cork this up and wait until I'm in the nursing home, can I? Tragically not, no. It's, um, you need to enjoy well, this. Point. I thought that was part of the joy of port, is that you can open it and drink it. For um, well, you, it'll last for a long... I mean, this is, is well, you know, you've got a... I think on this, you certainly got a couple of weeks probably on it. I would recommend uh, getting on the phone to James Purefoy mm. on a night when you've not oh, got the oh. children mm. and just quietly settle in the two of you and you can sit and pretend you're in the Garrick, aged 80 and start singing Send in the Clowns periodically as you sort of come round from your stupor. You're favouring the youth of this is, is, is because to get away from that heavy vintage port uh, vibe, is it? Is it yeah. A, do you think this is, this is fresher and slightly... That will be amazing 
for a very long period of time, you know, and in time, I think there was, this will become something that's magical and it'll evolve these tertiary aromas and you know, the, what you will find, actually the wine will become more knitted together, it'll become more unified and harmonious. I think there'll be really gorgeous wood spice that will emerge from it. But that, by that point, some of the fruit will fade away. And we accept that as part of the thing of drinking, you know, older wines, the fruit gently fades away. One of the things we sometimes have forgotten is that as people have become better at making wine, the, the ability to go and make wine that is delicious in its youth has become an extraordinary thing. I think somebody said that if there's a definition of fine wine, it should be a wine that throughout its life is quite magical. And there are some wines, I think in Burgundy sometimes, they say, well, you're not going to enjoy it for the first 10 years. You've got to kind of wait. They go, no, it, if you're a good winemaker, it should be nice pretty much on release. And I think this is a, a great example. This is a gorgeous drink today. It will also be a gorgeous drink in about 50 years' time. I think it'll be absolutely magical. So what have you been drinking inspired by the wine show since you came back? I've been drinking French white burgundy and Bordeaux again. <laughs> oh. Oh. All uh, that work. Very inspired by your in, by your by our English chat. So I've had a few uh, Moniers since we talked, uh, but I haven't. I mean, I can't get hold of these Portuguese wines. Where do you get them from? Well, so you know, look at the website. So everybody, including you, have a look at the comments below because we go and put in where you can get the retail is where you can go and get the wines from, and I'll, I'll sign up for the wine show uh, newsletter. You should, I should be sending you the wine show newsletter. I'll make sure well, you send it. I have... know you're, no one sends me anything. Right, it's got top tips in there of good, good wines to go and buy. I'm going to go and get you some good stuff. Oh, what were the big things you took away from appearing in the wine show? I tell you what the big thing was, which which is slightly against what I just said about my drinking habits since then, is is the joy, the celebration of wine as a truly international thing, as something that's. You know, we tasted wines from Thailand, didn't we? And from, you know, and the wine, uh, I really got a sense from the wine show that, that that is a celebration of wine as an international signifier of human civilization. Really. You can taste from all over the world. And that, that, that I didn't know. And I thought that's what's interesting about the show. There's no snobbery, I, I, I suppose, is what I, I got from it. You've enjoyed this, haven't you? I've absolutely loved it. It reminds me so much of our wonderful couple of days. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with all this wine now. It's not going to last, is it? I, I'm going to phone up James Purefoy. So get in the car. You'll need a taxi home. Get him over here. I think he is down the road. I'll give him a call. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a joy, Joe. You're so fascinating that I've never asked you a question you didn't know the answer. You're extraordinary. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Right. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you again very soon. Cheers, Joe. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jimmy. Don't say I don't get you out on a little jolly every now and then. The best text I've ever received. Yeah, well, there we are. You're a friend. <laughs> hey, say, Joe, you have found yourself a rather tasty little spot, haven't you? Welcome to Porto. Thank you very much. Yes. What do you know about Portuguese wine? I remember coming to Lisbon, but I have no recollection why. <laughs> Once again, we come to an astonishing landscape. It's breathtaking. Be a better person. I will be a better person. I'm better right.
it is that sense, isn't it, of discovery, of going outwards. Fear as and well. Obviously, you're going out into something that you have no idea what it is yeah. or what you're going to face or what kind of people you're going to see. It sounds or... rather like the wine show. I mean, this really does feel already to me like we could be having a really cracking adventure here. I haven't been worried about size. Go on, well, then take the little one. I'll take the little one. Smash this garlic. Drop from on height. Boss, 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 watch out for your shirt, James. <laughs> Dunk those wines in that ice. Your, I, yeah, I really feel. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I've become a little bit uh, <laughs> affected by that. Never seen you cry about that. <laughs> it happened when you're to actually me. drinking it. More setting. Gung Xia. My palate is insured okay. for over a million. Really? You just take the whole lot. Yeah, just have it all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>